Good evening, Beruchim Abayim Rabotai. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night's class. Tonight, our multiples of uh, reward for coming to learn are many times over. Um, the Yitzhah has a lot of interferences. If uh, a few weeks ago I told you one of the boys told me he has a 49 degree rule, I think we're almost at sub 49 tonight. Um, add on to that, uh, Turkey is a good competition sometimes. And Black Friday. So between everything, still come and learn. Tonight's shiur has uh, two uh, different sponsors. One was, one is Lili Nishmat, his father, Shalom ben Ephraim. Um, Ephraim ben Esther. Ben Esther. Shalom Ab- Abramov, I think, donated it for his father, um, Ephraim ben Esther. The other one, is a uh, Israeli uh, guy who just finished serving in the Israeli army uh, a couple of years ago who sponsored tonight's shiur in memory of two of his friends that were killed in combat Yaakov Yisrael ben Ilana Hashem in Kondamo and Golan ben Edna Hashem in Kondamo Hashem should take revenge for all those uh, wonderful young kids that served in the Israeli army that Lalein lost their lives in combat and we should never have any more Amen va Amen so, tonight we're going to discuss a subject that really should be discussed over many, many hours and many lectures. Maybe in the future we'll take different angles on it uh, to prove our case. But it really is, is my destiny sealed and from, I'm really just a puppet in the show? Or can I actually take, make an effect or do something that has to do with my actual destiny? This has to do with many, many areas in life. Um, the common ones that people think about are health, uh, parnosa, marriage, things like that. But technically it's every single step in, in life. Some that Gemara addresses clearly, others the Gemara doesn't address clearly. But tonight we want to take a general approach. And the easiest one to use is the case of marriage. And the reason why we're doing, using the case of marriage is because there the Gemara has a lot of conflicting information that's spelled out very clearly. And we might be able to utilize that uh, to come out with something new and nice that can be beneficial to all of us. So we begin with quoting a Gemara in Masechet Sota Dafbet, right at the beginning of Masechet Sota, very easy to remember where it is. And over there the Gemara says like this, Amar Rav Shmuel Bar Rav Yitzchak, Rav Shmuel the son of Rav Yitzchak says, Ki ha-bepatach yishlakish b'sota amar hachi. When yishlakish began teaching, Sota, he said like this: Mezavgim lo la adam isha, ei mezavgim lo la adam isha, ela lefi maasav. We don't, uh, let's just say, marry a person to a woman only based on his actions. And the Gemara proves that from pasuk in Tehilim Perek Kufay that the pasuk says ki lo yanuach shevet haresha al goral hatzadikim. That the tribe of evil won't be on the fate of the righteous. So therefore, if a person is a righteous person, he doesn't deserve an evil wife, and vice versa. Um, and as a result, when a person gets uh, married, they, in heaven they choose his wife based on his actions. The Gemara doesn't conclude there, as you all know. The Gemara continues and says, Am Rava Babachana, Rava Babachana says, Am Rav Yochanan, V'kashin lezavgan kekriyat yamsuf. And it's hard to get people married, uh, just like it was hard to do Kriyat Yom Suf. like it says, Elokim Moshivim Yechidi Baita Motzi Asirim Akoshot. All right. In other classes, we spoke about what does that mean? Hardship. There's nothing hard by God. How could it be hard? Um, and what's the parallel between Kriyat Yom Suf and this? What's one have to do with the other? Um, they're unlimited answers all the way from the Rishonim down to the current rabbis today that put out Sfarim. The one that I connected with most is an answer that I once heard from Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky that he said in a speech in the name of the Ponovich Rov. The Ponovich Rov said the parallel is very simple. I don't know how, if you guys are aware of the way the Israeli yeshiva boy shiduchim system works, but in Israel the shiduch crisis doesn't exist. What exists instead is called the financial crisis. Uh, not that Israel has a financial crisis. Actually, they're one of the only countries in the world that surpassed our 
past the financial crisis without getting affected by it much. But to marry off a daughter to a ben Torah in Israel is extremely expensive. Because based on your level of prestige in yeshiva is more or less the price tag that comes along with marrying you. For example, I had a friend in yeshiva that was considered one of the top boys in yeshiva, big Tamil Chacham, and his uh, criteria to agree to go out on a date was that his, the girl's parents had to commit to buy him two apartments in Jerusalem. One apartment to live in, and one apartment to rent out so he has an income for the rest of his life. He waited until he was 32, but he got it at the end. <laughs> and when he spoke by Yeshev Abachot that I attended, so he said, if people would have to wait 12 extra years or 10 extra years in order to make another couple of million dollars, I don't think they would say no. <laughs> now, I'm not justifying it. I think it's kind of sick that a person would even think that he deserves that. But, but that's the way it works. Now, over the years, obviously parents can't afford to do this. If a guy has 10 daughters, or, you got to be a, a multi-millionaire is not enough. He has to be in the hundreds of millions already to be buying such apartments. So they got a little smarter. And uh, now the standard went that there's, there's areas in Israel where they build these like new developments that are called projects, projectim, for religious people. And uh, they buy a, a, a boy, an apartment, dirabe project, an apartment in the project. Once a boy told me three months after he got married that I thought I was getting a dirabe poyek, an apartment in a project. Instead, I got a big project inside my apartment. That's what happens when you get married for the wrong reasons. But, um, so, Yaakov Galinsky said from the point of Yitzhak, what happened by Kriyat Yamsu? The, the water wouldn't split. Finally, Nachshon said, well, we've got to do something. So he jumps into the water. He jumps into the water, he gets to the point that the water's covering his nose and he's gonna, can't breathe anymore, he's going to die. So he said, nafesh, the water came and it's going to kill me. At that point, God split the sea. Now imagine, Nachchon was a very tall guy. So it would have taken a lot longer for the sea to split. Because his nose is much higher. Instead of being 6 feet, for example, he was 12 feet, so you've got to get much deeper into the water in order to get to that point. So the Panovich Rav told Rav Galinsky, who said it over, he said, that's what the Gemara is saying. So if you want to know how hard it's going to be for you to get married and to stay married, exactly like Kriyat Yamsuf. The higher your nose is, the more complicated it's going to be. The more you're willing to lower your nose, the easier it's going to be to live a good life. That's, by the way, I think we said it once. But the Gemara continues, and this is for what we're trying to go by tonight. Rav Yudah Marav, Rav Yudah Marav asks a very tough question over here. How can you tell me that the one you married is based on your actions? We have a direct contradiction to that. That we have a Gemara, it says in multiple places in Bavli, and others, it says, 40 days before a baby is born, a baby is even created, a bat kol yotzet velmeret, bat ploni leploni, a batkol comes out and says, the daughter of this guy is going to marry this guy, meaning Hashem already decided it before you were born, who you're going to marry, and when, by the way. And not only bat ploni ploni, bait ploni ploni. Which house are you going to buy? You ever bought a house recently? That was decided before you were born, that's what it says in the Gemara. Sadef ploni ploni. You invested in real estate. Your real estate investments were decided for you before you were born. So that's a direct contradiction. So which one is it? That's the Gemara's question. Is it, the woman who you will marry or married, or the man, it goes both ways, I'm just saying woman because that's the term that the Gemara is using, um, is based on your actions, or is it something that was dictated in advance and it's your destiny and it's beyond your fate? So the Gemara answers a very known answer. Lokashi, it's not a question. Why? Ha bezivug rishon, ha bezivug sheni. This one's talking about your first zivug, this, and the other one's talking about your second zivug. Meaning, when the Gemara says, when, when the Gemara says the 40 days before uh, Hashem decides who you're marrying, that's, uh, zivug, uh, that's zivug rishon. But the zivug sheni is already different. <coughs> what does it mean, by the way, mezavgim adam l'fim asav? So Rashi writes, Snual et tzadik. A woman who's modest to a righteous man, and Putsa, and a woman who's not modest, Lerasha, to an evil man. The Gemara continues. So the Gemara says, so the Zivuk Rishon goes 
based on your mazel. Rashi even writes those words, lefi hamazal, based on your luck, whatever that means. Zivuk sheni is lefi maasav, is based on his actions. And then Rashi adds in another thing, and why did the Gemara stick in this piece of kashel the zavgan? Because the kashel the zavgan lefi sheino bad zugo. It's much harder for a person to get remarried a second time because be'etzim it's not his zivuk because that's not what they decided for him in advance. That's the way Rashi learns the Gemara. Based on this, we have this thing in our minds, which I'm assuming all of us heard many times and assume that first marriage, second marriage. First marriage, HaKosh Baruch is 40 days before Yitzhirat Avlad decided for us. Bar Minan, we shouldn't know, second marriage is something that is a person obtains according to his mazal. All right. This is a Gemara that if I have to bet, all of you knew before I just quoted it, and I don't think any of us understand it because I got a few questions on this Gemara. If this is what the Gemara means, so I want to ask a simple question. God gave a guy a spouse. God gave a girl a spouse. They got married. Five years later, things didn't work out for tragic reasons. They got divorced. That was their Zivug Rishon. So, Hashem made a mistake. He didn't do his job right. What happened along the way? What happened? If it's according to his mazal, so that was his mazal. So that's what should have worked best. So if that's what should have worked best, what, I, what went wrong? And Zivuk Sheini, suddenly that has to do with me. Why doesn't God intervene? If anything, you should feel bad for me and help me even more. Not me, God forbid. Somebody. You should help somebody even more. And it seems like suddenly he mixes out and says, Lefimasa, based on your actions, and Kashe, it's going to be, you're going to have a hard time. And the truth is, ask any marriage therapist, um, second marriages are never exactly great, unfortunately. And today we're not even, recently I was talking to a therapist about this discussion, who specializes in this area, and somebody wrote a lot of research. Um, she specializes in it way more on the research end of the thing. She said, today we don't even do research anymore about second marriages, because we have people at a third and fourth, and it's very common. And she was showing me stats that are insane. I think we have a president like that, I don't know what number he's on. But uh, and I think in his mind he probably wants to say Ken Yilbu. But uh, that's uh, you know, everything became disposable in life, so so did relationships. Because of the severity of this question, I think we all understand that that can't be Pshad in the Gemara, even though it seems like from the simple reading of the Gemara and Rashi, that's what the Gemara means. And if we really wanted to nitpick and ask many more questions over here, there are many more to ask. For example, Tosfot says an interesting thing, discusses an interesting thing. Tosfot is bothered by, and there's another Gemara. The Gemara is in Masechet Moed Katan, Daf Yud Chet Amud Bet. The Gemara begins, right, right after the Mishnah over there, Amar Shmuel Mutar Laares Isha Becholos Shel Moed. In general, we have a rule, that that rule says, that Ein Me'alvin Simcha Besimcha. When you have one happy occasion, meaning, for example, a holiday, you're not allowed to do another Simcha during that Simcha. You can't mix another happy occasion with this happy occasion. Because it... Lessons from the importance of, so for example, if you wanted to get married on Chol HaMoyed Sukkot, you figure it's a perfect time. People are off, they're around, they're local, whatever. We'll make a big Sukkot, we'll make a wedding. You can't get married. But if you want to get engaged, so then the Gemara says, le'ares isha You are allowed to. Wait a minute, but what happened to Ein Marvin Simcha Simcha? You can't. Why? So the Gemara says, Shema Yikadmenu Achil. Because maybe if you don't propose then, and the girl's waiting for a proposal, somebody else is going to come, come propose first, and you're going to lose out on your wife. It's a Gemara. Sounds funny a little bit, right? We don't understand it. I'm going to skip a bunch of lines that talks about something else in the middle. And later on in the Gemara, going back to this subject, the Gemara asks, Could it be that Shmuel said that maybe somebody else is going to come and uh, get engaged to her before? Well, it can't be. Why? Rabbi Yudah said in the name of Shmuel, Every day, A voice from Shemayim comes out and says, The daughter of this one is going to marry this one. Every day it gets reiterated. 
this field is going to be for this one, and so on. I have an amazing story about this, by the way. A couple of days ago, I witnessed, I was shocked, I witnessed one person who wears a kippah steal from another person a deal that wears a kippah, but a big real estate transaction. Literally steal in a very disgusting way. And I was horrified by it. My stomach was turning. But the good news in the story was, was the guy was really ripped off in a very bad way. Was smiling and joking around as if nothing happened. He couldn't care less. You couldn't even see like one ounce of frustration. He didn't even say a nasty word to the other guy. You know, in, in normal cases, he would have been Gomer Alav Ta'alel. He would have finished him. Uh, he would have wished him and his mother, and if he has one, and his children for all the generations, all the problems in the world. Not a word, nothing. I said, this guy is some Balei Muna. I never heard of such a thing before. This is already out of control. So I wanted to learn what, uh, what Sefer of Emuna is he learning. That I want also have Emuna like that. I figured, obviously, he's learning something good. What am I missing out on? So I went out with him. I said, listen, I was involved. I witnessed the whole thing. And this is not human behavior. So either something's wrong with you, and then we have to get you help. Or you're a big Balei Muna, but Emuna doesn't come for free. It takes a lot of work. So how do you do it? He looks at me and he says, Daf Yemi. Two answers, that's what he answers me, Daf Yomi. I said, I heard a lot of things about Daf Yomi. I know they make events in stadiums and they do this and they do that. I never heard Daf Yomi making a person not fight in real estate. That I didn't hear before. I said, and just for the record, the other dude that just cheated you learns Daf Yomi. And the way I know is I see him in the shoes sometimes. So obviously it didn't work for him so well. <laughs> So could you elaborate maybe on that zgula that you have? Uh, what, 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 what is this? So he tells me, when you learn daf yomi, you learn gemara consistently. So you end up knowing babli. You don't know gemara? That's what I decided, this is what I want to talk about. So, which gemara are you talking about? So he said that every day a bat call comes out, sadeh ploni ploni. This property is going to belong to this person. So he didn't steal nothing from me. In Shammai, this morning, when the bat call came out, it said... The, field, the property is going to that guy, not to me. So what, I should be upset at God? That's pretty stupid. What a moon of a Jew. He didn't flinch. I witnessed the whole story. He didn't flinch. Like nothing happened. Like zero. Didn't affect the one drop. No. So the Gemara says, so now wait a second. On one hand, we say, you're allowed to get engaged on Cholam Oed and we don't have an issue of Malvim Simcha Simcha. But on the other hand, we say, why are you allowed to do it? Because maybe somebody else is going to come in and uh, jump ahead of you in the line of the zivug and destroy your zivug for you. On the other hand, we say that every day a bat kol comes out and says, bat ploni ploni. Or the gemara that we said before, in sota, that says 40 days before Yitzirat Avlad, even stronger. So what's going on? Which one is it? Comes the gemara and says, Ela shema yikadmenu acher berachamim. The gemara continues, but I'm stopping here. Maybe somebody else will pray harder than you on Chol HaMoed, and therefore he'll merit to get that girl or that boy, which is such a good girl or boy, a good catch, before you. So now the Gemara opens a whole new window to us, which we have to understand, and we have to know how this, what does this mean and how it applies. That, um, and the Gemara is satisfied that these two things don't contradict. That even though God went and said that this is technically who you're supposed to marry, if somebody else prays hard enough, he can change those rules. Ah. If this is what's decided, how, how can we change it? Second of all, what does that mean? That's, you could steal somebody else's mazel in life. By prayer, prayer is a holy thing. That's not something that you could do with what seems to be a wrong thing, an evil thing. What's the whole Gemara mean over here? It's a tough Gemara to understand, very, very tough Gemara to understand. But the Sfot Din, Sota, if we go back, is bothered by when it says Habazi Vuk Rishon Habazi Vuk Sheni Teima. He has a, he says it's a very hard question. <laughs> Over there, Moed Katan it says Dama Shmuel Mutar La Res B'Cholos Shel Moed Shemay Kadmenu Acher. And it asks from here, um, and it asks from here, meaning this Gemara of Arba'im Yom Kodim Mitzirat Avad, the forty days before we decided. Tosot said, Why does the Gemara over there answer? that maybe somebody else will pray harder and that's the reason now he's going to be able to get the zivug and that's why you're allowed to get, uh, get engaged in the Cholam Oed. The Gemara should have answered, a consistent answer would have answered over here, Masechet Sotah. Should have said, Kam Rishon, Kam 
Zivug Rishon is not to worry about. Zivug Sheni is, is based on the Fima Asav. So, so somebody could take away your second Zivug. That could have been a lot easier answer. And Tosot's question to him is so severe that he leaves it as Sarich Yun. He has no answer. Tema, and he leaves a blank. He has no answer to this. The truth is, we have to understand, because if you look good in the it's a very simple answer that I'm sure all of you are thinking. If we make the halacha, that you're, not allowed, to get, that you're allowed to get engaged in Chol HaMoed, based on the way Tosa wants to answer it, then it would only apply to somebody in a second marriage. The Gemara doesn't say that. The Gemara says the halacha is a universal halacha. Everybody's allowed to get engaged in Chol HaMoed. So by default, we can't use this answer, Lichua. Tosfot didn't say that, even though this is some, such a simple answer. If Tosfot didn't say such a simple answer, that does it, that, that's not a problem by Tosfot. That's a problem by us. That means we're missing something in the question, that we don't understand the question well enough why this answer wasn't good enough for him. And maybe tonight we'll be able to come out with something to answer that as well. So here, I want to go on a little journey to understand a few things. But first, I want to explain the idea not pertaining to the Gemara, the general idea, in one short summary, of what does it mean, Shema Yikad Menu Achel B'Tfilah. How Tfilah plays a role in every single angle of everything that we do, all day, every day. There's a mind-boggling story, it's brought down in the Sfarim. I'll tell you the truth, I don't know who the Baalei Maaseh are, and I saw them brought down in a few different Sfarim, and there's tiny differences, so don't hold me to the nitty-gritty details, but the details don't make a difference in the actual story, and it's beyond my control. Zilberstein brings down the story one way, and another sefer that I saw recently brings it down a little bit of a different way, but uh, it's minor details that really make no difference. In Israel, there's a very prestigious yeshiva, extremely prestigious yeshiva, in Bnei Brak, called Yeshivat Slabotka. Yeshivat Slabotka is one of the it's prestigious on many fronts, because the whole Mahalach there is to be a prestigious Jew. It's an unbelievable place. Huge Tamini Chamim come out, come out of there every year. In Shivat Slabotka, a bunch of years ago, there was a very tragic story that was very famous. Um, there was a boy who learned in the yeshiva who came out of first seder and he finished the morning seder. And they used to pray mincha right after they would finish the morning seder. And then I won something that, that's the only yeshiva in Israel do it. They pray mincha right after the morning seder. By the way, people don't know this, but that's why there's a custom in all Ashkenazi Shivot that they don't, by Mincha, they don't do Chazarat Hashatz. I don't know if you ever prayed Mincha in Lakewood Yeshiva or in uh, Ponovich or in Hebron or in any other Yeshiva, but they do a short Amida, no Chazarat. All Yeshivot universally. Um, all Litvish Yeshivot, at least. Uh, definitely the ones that have a Masovit. Some of the young Rashi Yeshivot think they're smarter and they change it, but. Uh, because they make a bit, you know, how can we miss Chazal Adashat? But, you know, if Dole Alam, if the Panovich Rav did this and this and that, this was done in Europe already before the war, meaning Dole Alam did it, there was a reason. Once they asked the Panovich Rav, why is it? Says, What's the difference? Two and a half minutes the extra, if they would do a whole Chazal, why not do Chazal? Why make it short? And the Panovich Rav answered a very interesting answer. He said, it's nothing to do with time. The boys would be glad to have Chazal Adashat. That's not what the issue is. He said, being that it works for the schedule of the yeshiva, to have mincha right after first seder, and in halacha it says if somebody talks during chazal adashat, it's the only time you have to yell at somebody. He says, the boys just finished learning for four hours. Where's their head? In the gemara. What are they busy with? A good question they had on a tosvot, the good malsha. Uh, that's the argument that he just had with his chavuta five minutes ago. So what's going to happen? It's going to be chazal adashat, and instead of them answering baruch hu shemo and amen, they're going to be talking and learning. And then I, the Rosh Shiva, I have to be the bad guy to yell at them, to tell them, you know, I want to talk during Chazal Adashat. So to prevent me having to yell at them, I decided to eliminate Chazal Adashat. Unbelievable. Number one, look how boys are shakua bilimud, how their life revolves around learning. And number two, look how careful even the Panovich Rav years ago was never to have to say a negative word to a boy. Today, principals freely uh, knock kids as if they don't exist. Oh, you stupid, how can you behave like that? Oh, I'm send Detention, this, that, I don't know what, each time they have a new name. You're going to get thrown out, you're going to get thrown in, you yeah. Today, and I say this clearly, and tonight my blood's boiling, because I had to be in two different funeral situations this week of boys, that the common denominator between both of them was a low life of Shiva through the matter of Yeshiva. 
over buttons, the color of the buttons of the jacket one of the boys was thrown out of yeshiva three years ago. And he overdosed on drugs yesterday and died. Because the streets took him and he had nowhere to go. He wasn't thrown out of yeshiva. This Rosh Shiva, unless he does a lot of tshuva, is thrown out of Gan Eden forever. He's a rotzeach, a murderer. He killed a Jewish child over what? The color of his button? And I wish I, this was an exaggeration. It's happening all day, every day. But you want to know what? I don't blame the Shiva completely. I blame a lot of us as well. Because I'm not talking about the part that maybe we should have got to him before he got to this situation. But why does the Shiva have to behave so crazy? Because in order for him to raise money, he has to be known as the best yeshiva. The best yeshiva, he has to have the strictest and craziest rules. So us that sp- support these yeshiva are the ones who are really fueling this craziness. If we would prioritize donating money to yeshivot that are for weaker boys, and the prestigious yeshiva come last on the list, because big deal, if they close down, the boys will continue learning anyway, nothing's going to change. And the boys and the yeshiva that deal with the weak boys, if they close down, these kids go to the street and their lifespan, in the best case scenario, is two to three years after that based on the current addiction rate. Then who comes first? What's more important? Where's the priorities? We got it all wrong. Somebody came to me for a donation this week and he tells me that he has the best koil in Israel. I said, first of all, you're arrogant. How do you know that your koil is the best? You're an arrogant person, I'm sorry. Let me tell it to you as it is. I said, second of all, exactly for that reason, there's, I, I want nothing to do with you. They said, why? I said, how many guys do you have here in Kuala? He said, 30. I said, let's say they, they are top guys. How much do you pay them a month? He tells me. Respectable amount. I was actually impressed that Osh Kuala was working so hard to pay his guys so high. I said, let me ask you something. Let's say tomorrow you went bankrupt. Is anybody in your call going off to Derek? No. What are they going to do? They'll go learn a mir instead. I said, guess what? I'm a big donor of the mir yeshiva. I'm a big fan of the mir yeshiva in Israel. And I hope all of you are the same. So I have the backup plan for you guys. So I don't need you. If they're good guys, they're going anyway somewhere else. So instead of learning and, thir- and having to pay rent on a building and expenses for 30 people, we'll do it in a building that has 5,000 people. It's actually a lot more economical per capita. It's a smarter way of doing things. You have a backwards way of thinking. It's, it's the guy, if you would tell me you have a kolel for guys that otherwise would go straight to the army, they wouldn't learn a day in their life, they wouldn't run a Jewish home, I'd be the first to go fundraising for you. Because they need you. For them it's pikuach nefesh, not the chas v'shalom. I'm downplaying the wonderful, prestigious yeshivot. And I have a huge akarat to tell. I had the merit to learn in Kol Torah and in Chevron and others. Um, so obviously, but at the same time, when there's blood spilling and, and there's kids dying, two that I know this week, imagine how many more there are that I don't know, I don't know everything. Just that I know alone, two boys. Young kids, 119, 121, tragic, tragic. Both kids with the same story. An idiot was Shiva that threw him out over nonsense. One, I happen to know the whole story. Over a button, I think I'm exaggerating, it's hard to believe, over... His buttons on his jacket, see, I wish I would have wore a jacket like that today, were brown. But, and the Shiva told him to change him to black, because not yeshivish. And the kid said, he, and the kid didn't even tell him no. The kid said, fine, he didn't get around to it, whatever, it wasn't on the top of his priorities in life. Are your buttons on the top of your priorities in life? Yeah. And two days later, he says, you, you, you have disciplinary issues, uh, out. His parents begged, pleaded. The father told me on the phone after he told me about his son's death. I pleaded with the Rosh Shiva. That's what you're throwing him out of? Buttons? And the Rosh Shiva answered him, he's destroying the image of my yeshiva. Destroying the image of my yeshiva. That's what he was concerned about. That's Chinuch, the image of your yeshiva. Destroying the image of Yeshiva. Crazy thing. That's for sure nothing in any way what HaKosh Baruch wants. So listen to the story that I started. In Slabodka, there's a good boy, top boy, who after first Seder, if you're going to pray Mincha, so Yeshiva boys wear a hat and jacket when they pray. Now they're not going to sit a whole day and learn in a hat and jacket, that's not doable. So they, they have hangers downstairs, they go down, they get their hats and jacket, they come back up, they pray Mincha. This boy just finished learning, he's going down the steps, 
You know the yeshiva there, there's about 30 steps to go down to where they keep their stuff, to, and then come back up. Though we should never know, he slips on the first step, goes tumbling down, lands on his head, boom, terrible. A few minutes later, he's in the hospital in critical, critical condition. Obviously, the yeshiva is all shaken up. And the staff is the most shaken up because this is on their, this is their boy. This is, this is a kid that a mother sent to them, and they're responsible for him. And naturally, what do you do in a situation like that? You call the mother the first thing, right? But here they had a very tough dilemma. And we should never know of such tragedies ever again in Amisa. The mother was a fresh widow. She had just lost her husband. This boy is her only child. And they were extremely scared to pick up the phone and call the mother. Because they said if they call the mother, then she might die from the news. And now we're going to have... Uh, it's bad enough her husband died. Now we're going to have a widow too. Uh, the widow dying too. So the Rashi Shivot sat and they consulted also with Gdalei Israel. And together, the Gdalei Israel said a very interesting thing. I'm not saying that anybody's allowed to do such a thing in other situations. You can't learn from this or other things. But they concluded that Alpi Alacha, for at least two days, they don't have to tell the mother. And they should cover up for it in any way possible because hopefully it'll get better. Because the mother emotionally shall collapse. It could be a pikuach nefesh. It can kill her. You have to hide it from her. There is such a thing sometimes with very old people that lost a loved one, they hide him. Abel Yashif, some of his daughters passed away and they didn't tell him. Because he was so old and so frail that they were scared for his health. That's the right thing, Abel sometimes. But obviously you can't learn the general thing. Each time you have to do a do to do. But that's what they will posek the halacha. Lo aleinu, two days didn't even go by and the boy passed away. And now what they thought was going to help became even worse. They didn't know what to do. The Rashi Shivot sat together and said, what do we do? And they ended up concluding that all of them are going to go together to the mother, because each one has a different mm-hmm. way of saying things and that, so if she collapses, maybe we won't be able to give a chizuk, because she did, and They come, you know, all the, the whole staff of the yeshiva comes to the mother. You know, in the army they say when you get a knock at the door at night, when a parent gets a knock at the door at night, it's not good news. If, if a whole staff of the yeshiva comes to a Jewish mother, it's not good news normally. One yeshiva maybe, but a whole staff to the yeshiva, it's very rare. It's very rare. There are Ashe yeshivot that stand out, that are exemplified in the way they behave. There's a yeshiva in Lakewood that I'm proud to say my son studies in, called Nezer Torah, ran by a great, great rabbi. His name is Rabbi Rafael Bruce, a tzaddik, unbelievable person. And on countless occasions, he picks up the phone randomly, and I used to feel special until I found out that he does this to almost every parent, but guess what? I feel even more special now that my son's learning by him. And he says, I just called to tell you that your son's doing well. Normally when you get a phone call from the Shiva, it's either your kid's in trouble, or I need money. I just called to tell you that your son's doing well. You should have a lot of nachat for him. You should enjoy him. I'm proud of him. And not once in five years. All the time. All the time. And once he sent me, this is a funny story, just two years ago about, my son's already in 12th grade there, he sent me a text message. He tried to call me three times in a row. It was during holiday season, I was beyond busy. I felt terrible. I sent him a text back saying, I'm sorry, Rabbi, I know it's wrong, but I'll call you back later because it's just too overwhelming right now. And he texted me back. I just want you to know that your son's doing extremely well. And, All right. I send them, thank you very much, and I'll call you. The next day, he calls me again. And I'm thinking to myself, you already told me he's doing good. What? So I was sure that this time it's for sure for money. And there are times he calls for money, he needs money. I pick up, I say, Rabbi, how are you? And that, I'm sorry about yesterday, I apologized to him. And I'm waiting, you know, the Rabbi any money, it's yonder, whatever, you know, that's what I'm, that's what we're expecting. That's the next part of the conversation, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm happy to give. And he tells me, I'm calling you because I'm scared. I realize now that on the text I sent you yesterday, I didn't write your son Yossi, I just wrote your son. I don't want you to think it was a copy and paste that I sent to anybody else. That's an Oshiva that's going to build Dolei Israel. That's an Oshiva that every student that's going to go through his system is going to succeed because he cares and loves the kids so much 
And he's so sensitive to everything around the kid that when the kid comes home, he should have a supportive environment and his parents should be proud of him and the kids should feel that his parents are proud of him and he should feel the love at home. That's a guy who's going to build a future in Galei Now you have a group of Slabot, Karashe Yeshiva and Ramin that have to go into a mother who's a widow and tell her that her only child died on their blood, on their ex- account, on their time clock, and they didn't even tell her that he was injured. They go into the mother and they're expecting the worst. And surprisingly enough, the mother listens, she gets up, doesn't even shed a tear, like a strong woman. She says, Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Yishem, Hashem Yorach, one day I'll see him in Gan Eden. That's it. As if nothing. They were scared, maybe she lost it. So they decided to stay. So they stayed with her for a little while. After a while she told them, I'm 100% fine, you have nothing to worry about, I just have one request from you, I want the funeral to go from the yeshiva tomorrow. Not only funerals leave from the house some, or from the synagogue or whatever, not inside the synagogue, outside the synagogue. She wanted the funeral to leave from the, this is the yeshiva in London for, a lot of, for not a lot, but a few years. And he did well in. Yeah. Of course, what's the question? They said, sure. And here's where an interesting thing happened. They had the funeral in the yeshiva. Tons of people came from many other yeshivas as well. A tragic story. Everybody felt sympathy ten times over for a story like this. And before they were going to take the kid to the cemetery where they were going to bury him, the mother goes to the Shiva and says she wants to speak. In the Haredi world in Israel, women don't speak in public. <coughs> Maybe for ladies, yeah, I don't know, but for men, for sure not. And in the yeshiva, definitely not. And the whole thing makes no sense. And by a funeral, also not. And and there was Rashi Shivot that were talking between each other. What do we do? And one of the Rashi Shivot said, "Api Adlocha, she's an almana. Not only that, she just lost a child. Who knows why? The, what she wants to say, or what's it? What could be? This is what's going to help her heal one day and may, uh, allow her to live a normal life. And even though it's against everything that we would ever do, and it makes no sense, we have to allow her to speak. But they were petrified when she got up because." She has the right to be angry at the yeshiva and at the staff, and who knows what she could say. And she got up, and roughly this was what her speech was. She said, my son died. And I want to clarify. I'm not upset at Hashem. I'm not upset at the yeshiva. I'm not upset at the Hashem yeshiva. Nobody did anything wrong. Nobody was negligent. Nothing bad happened. Adarava, he died before he was 20. There's no onish karet even. I mean, he's going straight to Ganeid into the highest place. He died through learning, after learning first say, they're going to Mincha. Even his death was Bigdusha. I have no complaints to anybody in any way. Other rabbi, I say thank you to Hashem for giving me the merit to have such a son for this amount of years. But there's one thing that bothers me. And I want to say it in public so it's never done again to anybody. If they would have came to tell me, tell me that my child was sick, maybe he would still be alive. Not because I'm a doctor. Not because I have medical contacts. Not because I would have had any way to help him. But because there's nobody who would cry more tears over her son than a mother. And maybe my tears would have saved his life. And then they buried the kid. Later on, one of the Hashem Shivata Slavodka said that of his whole life of learning Musa, this was the biggest Musa speech that he ever had in his life. Here's a woman who gets to the highest level of dignity in behavior, to the highest level of emuna in behavior, but also doesn't forget what the koach filah, what the power of the tears of a Yiddish mama, of a Jewish mother, or anybody is in order to save a life, in order to better somebody's life. So now we understand a little bit of a grasp of what it means, shame ikad menu achel You have to understand logistically, how could that work? That's already a problem that we still have to explain. But... Um, which I don't know if we'll get to tonight. Uh, but the idea, we understand. So now what is it? So I'm giving you a watered-down version of what the Hasid Ya'abet says in the Hagaot, al Rashas, on the Gemara and Masechet Sota. And this, I'm purposely a watered-down version because otherwise, again, it would take way too much time to explain a lot of other details that he sticks in. And this is the answer definitely when it comes to Shiduchim. But it's, it's true straight across the board in many other areas as well, and we can prove it from many places in the Torah. The Chassid Yavetz writes that Zivug Rishon and Zivug Sheni 
is not referring to first marriage and second marriage. Because that's a mistake. We got it all wrong. So what Zivug Rishon, what Zivug Shini? Comes the Hasid Yahavetz and writes that HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts the Neshama of a person in this world pure. Boy and girl alike. Some boys and girls choose to keep themselves pure. That's called Zivug Rishon. When they get married, their zivug is from, directly from Hashem, and it's 100% pure. Other boys and girls don't care what they do before they're married. I'm single, I can do whatever I want. I don't know nothing to nobody, I'm a bachelor. Leave me alone, what does it make a difference? I want to have fun. Everybody has fun today. Then, when they get married, it's called zivug sheni. Because the neshama is already not pure, the hisdavgut, the connection can't be the same as it would have been otherwise. Now listen to this. You want to break it down in a very simple terms? Excuse me for the example and the bluntness, especially on the female side, forgive me. But uh, if you took a piece of duct tape and stuck it onto your arm, waited about three seconds and then pulled it off. Girls call it a waxing. It kind of hurts. But now imagine that take the same piece and put it on your other arm. Wait a few seconds, pull it off. It's also going to hurt, a little less. Put it on another place in your body, wait a few seconds, take it off less. By the time you try the fourth place, it won't even stick. There'll be nothing to take off. What changed? That more dirt, hair, other things got stuck onto the adhesive part. And as a result, it doesn't stick again as good. Kan bezivug rishon, kan bezivug sheni is exactly that. A Gosh made a neshama with a flawless adhesive. And that when a person gets married, he can have a flawless marriage. Yeah, he'll have some struggles, yeah, some avodat amidot, but that's the extent of it. But some people choose to ruin the adhesive first. And then there's problems afterwards. Kasheh, you will go, it's hard, because it's not sticking. It's like today the kids say, we don't click. We don't click. You ever what, observe the young couple when they're dating, and then waited three months and saw the way they looked three months after, after three months of marriage. It's an amazing thing to see. A guy and girl go out on a date to a restaurant. You know, one of their first dates. He's opening the door for her. He's pushing in the chair. He's like a waiter. He works. He's just missing the white gloves. Uh, he wouldn't take one bite of food before she ate. She's never hungry no matter what. Uh, and even after she's convinced to eat something, it's like, Miniature bites that, uh, you know, bird food is bigger than that. <laughs> Forks and knives for everything in the world. Uh, that is not, nobody goes on a first date and orders chicken fingers or chicken wings or whatever. It doesn't work that way. And if you ever did go on a date with a guy and he ordered chicken wings, dump him. Because food that you have to eat with your fingers means you're not a person. People don't eat with their fingers. People eat with a fork and knife. I have no problem saying it. I know it's football season. It's not common to say it right now. Who cares? That's the truth. It's an amazing story, by the way, about Kivege. Kivege in the yeshiva, he wanted to see where the boys are holding in life. So what did he do? Not in learning, in learning he knew, he used to talk to them. In Derecher, it's in Midot, where are they holding in life? So he told the cook one day, do me a favor, today when you cook them, they used to give them meat for lunch, because so, it gave you energy, so they would be able to learn the whole day afterwards. Supper, they would already have dairy. Um, a lot of yeshiva till today it's like that. Because they figure you needed something healthier and stronger to keep it going for all the hours. At night, anyway, you're going to sleep in a few hours. You can get away with something cheaper. So he tells the cook one day, do me a favor, when you make the meat today for lunch, make it come out rubber. Yeah. Overcook it, it should be as rubber as could be. He kind of said, like, somebody who goes to a very high-end steakhouse and asks for a steak well done. That's what he really said. For that, just eat a burnt hot dog. It's the same thing. Why do you waste your time and money? Make it. It should be hot to eat. The cook said, Rabbi, haram. It's expensive meat. Why would I do that? He says, I, I'm the boss. I bought it. I pay you. That's what I want. No. He did the mitzvah all the way. The rabbi said, the rabbi said, he made it like a tire. Tire quality meat. The boys come down for lunch. They take their portions. First guy sits down. He can't bite it, he can't cut it, he can't do anything with this thing. He tries to bite it, he sees there's nothing doing, he says, ah, I forget it, we'll go back to life. 
He leaves it on the table and he goes back to work. Another boy comes. He thought of a little bit of a patent. He went and he took his fork and he started daggering the meat to make it into chopped meat or something, you know, to soften it. So, haram, the boy's hungry. At least he'll have something to eat. Fine. Can I saw that? It makes sense. Smart boy. He had a problem. He had a solution. He did it. He ate. He left. One of the boys in Rabbi Kivega's yeshiva, he saw that the boy went, and after trying to cut it and it didn't work, he picked up the meat with his fingers, and he tried to bite, you know, like to force, it, force bite it. Then Rabbi Kivega walked into the dining room. It's hard to believe on Kivega that he would be busy with this. And he told him, I'm very sorry, but you either have to learn a lot of Musa and change all your ways, or you shouldn't be in yeshiva. And the boy said, what do you mean? He said, today you're eating with your fingers, tomorrow you'll eat with your feet, and the third day you'll steal from somebody. He says, that that's where it starts. The second you lose human dignity, from there downhill is a spiral that's out of control. Unbelievable thing. Unbelievable thing. No. Comes the Avets and writes, on one hand, 40 days before you tzirat the Vat, says, this is what's going to happen to you. But then Akash Baruch tells you like this, that's contingent on the fact that you live a life of Zivug Rishon. But if you live a life of Zivug Sheni, sorry, that I can't guarantee for you anymore. The Gemara makes the same parallel when it comes to Parnasa. Kol Yom Bat Kol Yotzet Sadeh. An Rosh Shana, Akash Baruch Hu decided, Kol Mezonotav Shel Adam Ketsuvim Lo Me Rosh Shana Rosh Shana. From Erev Rosh Hashanah to Erev Rosh Hashanah, technically. Because Rokhul decided exactly how much money you're going to have this year. So what, what am I going to work for? I'm wasting my time. And on the flip side, why can't I be reckless with my money? I shouldn't decide anyway. You know, the answer is two things. Number one, how do you know if you're in the situation of Zivug Lishon Hashini? Are you flawless with the way your financial behaviors were this year? Or maybe you loaned another Jew hard money with interest, which is against the Lecha. Maybe you charge the client interest, which the Gemara says on that, if it's a goy, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a Jew, I mean, if it's a goy, it's a mitzvah. I don't know about a goy. Maybe you do this, maybe you do that. That's number one. Number two, it's also brought down, the Maral says, it doesn't say how much Hashem is going to give you money. Hashem decides how much money you have. And he leaves it in Shamayim. And now you have to tap into the resource. It's like you have money in your bank account, but you need cash. If you don't go to the ATM or your debit card, you won't have the cash. You've got to pull it out. But somebody who lives a life of Zivug Rishon, Hashem just sends it. He doesn't have to make it. It just comes. Somebody who lives a life in business of Zivug Sheni, he walks the gray line, he's in trouble already. Then he has to work ten times as hard. Everything else is so much more complicated. The same applies to kids and other things, and, and the list goes on and on. But I think over here there's a huge, huge lesson in, in the whole idea. I want to take this Yavetz a step further. And unfortunately, I don't have time to start rattling off sources to prove my case, but I have a very strong case to this. And that's for the married ones amongst us. Zivug Lishon, Zivug Sheni is not only one time the night you get married. Zivug Lishon, Zivug Sheni is your entire life. Why does the Gemara have another version? Bechol Yom Bayom Bat Kol Yotzet Vomeret Bat Ploni Ploni. Every day again, Hashem recreates the world uh, every second again. HaMchadesh B'Tuvah B'Chol Yom Tamit Ma'asei B'Rishit. HaKosh Baruch Hu every day re- reassesses how is your zivug going to look? Is your zivug going to look? Is your marriage going to look like a zivug Rishon? Is it going to be a life of a zivug Rishon? Or is it going to be a life of a zivug Sheni? And who decides that? Ein Mizavgin La'adam Ela Lefi Ma'asav. When you decide how you want to behave, Hashem decides how your marriage could be after that, based on that. If you behave a life of Zivug Rishon, so then after you're married, your marriage is as good as could be. But if you behave a life of Zivug Sheni, so then of course, yeah. In Israel, three years ago, there was a tragic stat that more people got divorced than got married. It's crazy. Because they live a life of Zivug Sheni. It's not a chidush. I'm surprised that until now it wasn't like that. According to the Gemara, that's the way it should be. That's, that's very normal. There's nothing wrong with that. No. If, if this is the case, maybe we can end off with something that has to do with the parasha and 
we'll finish this puzzle. And again, I stress, really, we should elaborate so much more on the subject, but we're on time constraints. Um, I actually want to give you two thoughts. One is on the behavior of a person. The idea of behaving a life of Zivug Lisha. What's a life of Zivug Lisha? And it links right into what we said, and it links right into the idea of the prayer that we spoke about. It really pieces things together. So listen to this. This I didn't read, I actually heard. I like giving credit to where credit's due. Um, there's a rabbi that recently I've been quoting a lot. He's a friend of mine from Israel. His name is Rav Alan Levi. He puts out a weekly four-minute he- clip in Hebrew on the parasha. This is his clip on this week's parasha that I saw on my way here. Um, brilliant. The Torah says a very interesting thing in the, in, in, when it comes to Yaakov preparing to meet Esav. He woke up that night. He took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children, and he crossed over Ma'aval Yabok. By the way, in Kabbalah, there's a very, very lengthy explanation of what it means, Ma'aval Yabok. You know, there's a lot of secrets in that part. But look at Rashi over there on the spot. And Rashi brings down an interesting thing. Rashi says, Yabok Shem Nahar, it's the name of a river, fine. But, before that, Rashi says, "Ve'et achad asar yiladav and his eleven children. Ve'dina eichan aita. Where was Dina? He had eleven boys, but he had a girl too. Why doesn't it mention Dina? It says that he went and he took his four wives, so meaning his two maids and his two wives, and uh, his eleven boys. What happened to Dina? Well, why do we skip her? Natna beteva ve'naal befaneha. He put her in a box and he locked it to hide her." Why? That Esav shouldn't see her. Comes Rashi and brings down from Chazal. And therefore Yaakov Avinu was punished. That he held back the opportunity for Esav to marry his daughter. Who would want Esav to marry his daughter? He got punished for that. Why did he get, why did he get punished? Shema, maybe, yachzirenu lemutav. She would make him do tshuva. Wait a second. Imagine, uh, if one of you are still single, I come to you and I say, girl, I got a good shidduch for you. You say, who? So I know a guy. Let me tell you his, uh, let me send you his resume. Give me your email address. You give me the email address. I send you his resume. On November 1st, 2018, he was, uh, he was arrested for grand larceny. He did three years' time for money laundering. He did this, he did that. He's a criminal from the day he was born. I don't think he would ever come back to Ashir again, right? Rightfully so. <laughs> Probably it would be a lot worse than just that. Then you're an honest person, and you say, listen, he's an intellectual, he doesn't do random things. Let's see what he was thinking. Pick up the phone and say, what were you thinking? How evil could a person be? I said, I learned it from Arashi. Arashi says, they saw there was a gangster that killed, that did, that right? Chazal say all the things that they saw did, we learned about it last week, in great graphic detail, two weeks ago, I think. He was worried, he was a murderer, and a lot worse, in all areas. Chazal, Chazal say, that Yaakov even got punished, that he didn't let Dina marry him, Shema yachzirenu lemutav. Maybe he shall make him do tshuva. Huh? Same story. You have to understand this. When Aflav yad Shechem, what was the punishment? And she fell in the hands of Shechem and she got molested. And she got pregnant out of that. And it was a tragic, tragic story. And they had to kill a whole city to get her back too. And uh, Shimon and Levi got cursed by Yaakov Avinu at the end of his life for that. Meaning, in, in Jewish history, we paid a price for it many, many times over. For, the, for what? For hiding a girl from a rasha. How does this make sense? So there's a very, very known, well-known pshat. From Simchot Bunim, from Pishcha. He writes like this. He says, of course, Yaakov, you don't have to allow Dina to marry Esav. That's not, that's not a question. So what does it mean, Shema Yachzirena Lemutav? 
when Yaakov Avinu was going to put the Nata Haider from Esav, what was he thinking? I have a brother. He's a Rasha. Therefore, I have to keep my daughter away from him. Therefore, I'm hiding. Up to here, everything's okay. But if you have a brother who's a Rasha, and to such an extreme that you have to hide your own child from him, why didn't you think of crying and praying that he should do tshuva? Why didn't you think of coming to Hashem and saying, I don't want to have to hide my daughter from him. Hashem, change his heart around. Make his heart be a heart that's a good heart. Because he didn't think of praying for his brother to do tshuva. Which brother? The brother that vowed to kill him, that he's now scared that's still going to kill him, that he was convinced is going to kill at least half of his family, probably even more. That he needed a miracle for himself not to be killed, right? Chazal bring down, Rashi brings down. That Hashem had to make a nest that his neck turned into a, me- a marble in order for Esav not to be able to bite his neck off, which is what he tried to do. This brother who wants to kill him, Hashem punished him with such a severe punishment with his daughter. Why didn't he pray that she should, that, that his, his brother should do tshuva? We learn from here two things. Number one, that even on a rasha like that, a prayer could help. But number two, we also learn how much a person has to care about somebody else. Now listen to an amazing story. There's a Rosh Yeshiva, Mashgiach in Hebron Yeshiva, for a while, for a long while. His name was a Tzihil Shpalei, a giant. There's no, uh, a, unfortunately, he was very low key. He didn't make a lot of noise. That was his nature. So the Lama Torah, except for the Hebron students, didn't really reap from him the benefits that they should have because they weren't so aware of what a giant they were losing out on. It was a, t- a giant in Musal, in Torah, in everything. There's no end. Not only him, his wife. They were, they were giants in every sense. He didn't believe in minding boys' businesses. Normally, a mashgiach is supposed to be a policeman, right? Why'd you come late? He was very against that. He said, boy, if a boy came late, that means he wasn't capable of coming before. Now I'm going to go make him feel bad. I've got to point out his weaknesses. His whole approach was the opposite extreme. Let's make everybody feel great. And he was very complimentary and very, he was very involved in helping the boys. He was also very careful that every boy should have money and this, so they shouldn't feel less than anybody else. And if you saw a boy that his hat didn't look nice, he right away gave him money to buy a new one or this. He was very involved. And heaven then, there was 800 boys, now it's more blue than And he knew every single boy down to what he ate for breakfast, you know, every detail. The boy didn't like the food in yeshiva, he would have his wife cook him food. He went to extremes. And we're not talking about a person who's bored in his life. We're talking about a Jew who knows Kola Torah Kula Baal Peh and all the Sifrei Musar and Tamid Chacham, you know, like the way we would relate to it is like Avshach. It was like a walking Avshach. There was a boy in Hebron. Normally Hebron attracted smarter boys. Um, there was a boy in Hebron for a while that he wasn't uh, the smartest boy, let's just say that. And some struggles with him came to learn. He was a very good boy. He's amazing. But learning, he had struggles. He had a lot of struggles with him. Avir knew about it, and he, he insisted that the boy joins the yeshiva anyway, because he was of the belief that if you instill self-confidence into somebody, the biological factors of his IQ doesn't make a difference, and we can get him to be smart. And we can get him to learn and do well. And he invested a lot of time in making sure that nobody says anything wrong to the boy and protecting him and getting him good people to study with that could help him out. And the boy was advancing nicely. When the boy's mother said, was involved in allowing him to go to Hebron Yeshiva, she was very scared. She was technically against it. Because she knew he was going into one of the top yeshiva in Israel, and she knew her son. He's not capable of it. She was scared he's going to be smothered there. And the only reason why she agreed was because Rav Hilsch told her that, uh, don't worry, I'm going to keep an eye on your son. He said something, so she agreed. But she was still worried. A mother's a mother. So once in a while, she, I don't think she had a husband, she used to pick up the phone, and she would call this great rabbi, and, and he would pick up, that's the amazing part, and ask, as my son doing? And every time he would, you know, give her a report. Don't worry, he's, yeah, he's fine, yeah, he's doing well. Now's the amazing thing. 
One day she calls him up and she says, Rabbi, I'm very worried. I'm losing sleep. He says, well, what's that? He said, I was talking to my son on the phone two days ago, and he happened to mention to me that in a few days he has a very big test in his year. He says, Rabbi, you know my son. With all that you're trying and everything, he doesn't have a memory. How's he going to take a test? And then he's going to get a zero on the test. He's going to be shattered. I'm very, very worried. I can't sleep at night. Apirish tells her, don't worry. It's my responsibility. I'll keep you updated. And he hangs up. He goes to the bochen, to the one who gives the test, and he tells him like this, to give the kid a free pass, out of the question. Kids have to learn to work. But to expect of him what you expect of these geniuses of Heaven and Yeshiva is also out of the question. It's not fair. It's not a fair playing field. Make him a custom test that's doable for where he's holding in life. Don't look for the cheap way out, but, but it should be doable. And not even doable easy enough that he gets 100. Even if he gets less than that, it's fine. He should have to work. It should be hard for him, but not too hard. It should be realistic. This guy, this Bochem, he has 800 boys to write a test for. He says, Rabbi, I gotta write a separate test for this one kid. He says, Yeah, every Jew is the price is the same. You gotta write. He agrees, he does it. The morning of the test, Avish asked the Bochem, do me a favor. The minute the tests come back in, you find this test out of the pile of 800 boys, you pull out this test. You mark it honestly, no games, and you call me immediately and tell me what happened. Okay, and the rabbi says, the rabbi says, the test is over, he takes the papers, he looks, he finds the paper, he marks it. Happens to be a kid who did very well. See, he did very well. And Avirsh goes running to the phone, Bissim Chagdola, to tell the mother the good news. I'm sure Avirsh cried a lot the night before that this boy should be Matzliyev. I knew him, I knew his nature. Once I started telling him something personal about an issue that I was going through, I was 16, and he turned to me and he said, can you please come back tomorrow? Not because I don't have time, I always have time for you, but because the amount of tzavot I heard today can affect my life and I won't be here tomorrow. So give me until tomorrow to recuperate, and then tomorrow I could listen to more. Understand how a person, what it means to care about Kali Yisrael? And when he said it, he meant it. There was no jokes by him. By him, every word was 100% literal. Calls the mother. The mother doesn't pick up. Calls again. No. Then there's no cell phone spell. So, uh, those days weren't, didn't exist. Figured maybe she's at work. She's at. He wants to reach her. So he goes to the son. And he tells him, listen, amazing thing. I decided to review the test to the boys. You don't want them to feel weird that you know they did something special for that. And I saw you got a good mark and that. I'm so proud of you. You know your mother's in touch with me sometimes, and whatever, she deserves the nachat, I'm, I'm trying to reach her. And uh, she doesn't pick up. Tell me, does she have a work number, what time she gets home, when can I reach her? I want to talk to her a minute earlier. And the boy turns red and tells her, Fish, no, this is a very sad thing, and I was going to come talk to you because I don't know what to do. My mother felt very ill in the middle of the night last night, and she's in a hospital. The only reason why I didn't leave yeshiva was because I knew I had the test, and... It was important to me to take the test and whatever. Later on today, I have to go visit her. Now, he says, which hospital? That's all he asked. He tells him her name. I said, thank you. She should have a flash later. And he leaves. And now, here's Pale, with all his 80 years, Gadol Anak Sheba Anakim, that built tens of thousands of students for Kala Yisrael, some of the greatest minds and the greatest delay Torah, the chief, current chief rabbi of Israel, of Yitzchak Yosef, went by him, of David Yosef, went by him. Uh, Rabbi sent all his kids, not all, but almost all his kids to learn by him. You know, just to look at him, it's worth going. It's, uh, that's on the smart again. The Havdil, a lot of famous politicians. Uh, Heaven always put out successful people, either in pol- politics or in Torah, or in this, uh, it's a yeshiva that was always, because the attitude, when they, gave, I mean, they built people up to believe in themselves. If people believe in themselves, they succeed. It's that simple. Gets onto a bus, so he was very against taking ta- taxis. He felt it was a waste of money. And he takes a bus, I don't know how many buses was involved there, but it was definitely a few because of the hospital she was in. And he takes a few buses and spends half a day getting to the hospital. And he gets to the hospital and goes to visit a woman who's laying in a hospital bed. 
she sees her here standing by the door and what? And he said, I just came to tell you that I tried to reach you right away today and I couldn't meet you and I found out that you're in the hospital and your son did unbelievable on the test and that, here's a copy. He had nothing to worry for. You see, I told you he's all right and he's doing very well. And now you're also not feeling well, so of course, what's your name? I want to down for you and that and I want to wish you a fresh day on and see if you need anything and asks her all the questions about her medical situation, what she needs, or this, how to help her, that. After a few minutes, the lady looks at here and says, Rebbe, I have a one-word question. It's the only thing I need from you. Why? You're not a young man. You have 800 boys on you. You're the most prestigious mashgiach, the most prestigious yeshiva. To go drag half a day on buses to come tell me that my son did well on the test, they could have waited for tomorrow and I'd be released from the hospital. And Nafirsh looked at her with a blank stare and said, I have no way to answer that question because I don't understand what the question is. By me, it was never a question if there's a way to make somebody's life more pleasant one second earlier that it's worth every place in the world. I just can't answer you. I said, no, nothing could wait till tomorrow in my world. Nothing would wait another hour. If there's a way now to make you happier, one drop, that's it. We're done. That's a life of Zivug Rishon. Zivug Sheni. The life of Zivug Sheni by me is the life of one minute. Everything's one minute. Give me a minute, I'm busy now. Give me a minute, I'm busy now. Give me a Later, 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 and later never happens. Don't say when I'll have time, I'll learn, because maybe you'll never have time. We're always we're all busy, right? I love sometimes when I, not for myself, but for others or whatever, it's all Habim, I need a favor from somebody, and I call somebody up, and he, I said, do me a favor, take care of this and this right away. And he tells me, yeah, by the end of the day. So I never, I never say anything, because nobody knows, owes me anything. It's not for me, it's for Kali, so. And at that point, I do feel an obligation, maybe, of showing somebody that they could do things quicker. So this is the way the conversation normally goes. I said, Sadiq, I'll find somebody else to do it. I appreciate it, because I need it done within the next two minutes. But I just want to ask you, how many uh, doctors did you speak to today? How many shiurim did you say already today? How many funerals did you have to attend? How many sick people did you have to console? How many families did you have to keep calm? How many poor people did you have to feed? And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And the answer normally to all of the above is zero. I said, okay, now it's about three in the afternoon. I already had to do about 60 to 80 of each. And you're telling me you got no time? I said, and there are people in this world that I know that probably have done, unfortunately, 200 of each. And when I call them, they do have time. Because I call them many times a day on busy days. What's the answer? For what's important to you, you have time. And what's not important to you, you don't have time. One minute means you're not important to me. That's what one minute means. Because for what's important to you in life, you always have time. And pay attention when somebody wants to do something, somehow he does it right away. It doesn't take weeks, it doesn't take uh, He does it. it. Makes sense, it doesn't make sense, it's a crazy thing, it's a smart thing, doesn't it? There's no rules, no laws. He does it! That's not, he's not important. That's it, the world goes. Sometimes I see people telling others, wait five minutes, or I'll call you back in five minutes. And what's the guy so busy with at that time? He's in the middle of playing a game on the computer. He's in the middle of one of the stupid games, virtual reality games. I don't know the names of all the new ones. And uh, that's more important right now. So that he has time for, in the middle of the work day, even though he's stealing from his boss time and so on. But for somebody who needs something urgent, which could be his own spouse, his own child, I'll call you back later. Priorities. Kan bezivuk rishon. If you want to have a zivug rishon, it has to be that that's what comes first. That's your top priority in life. Kan bezivug sheni. Other people live a life that's very hard because it's secondary. Because that's everything to them is secondary. Soon, I'll do it later, I'll do this, that. Uh, everything's soon. By the way, there's a maral that brings down. And, I, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm caught between how to phrase this because I want to say I hope there's others that argue on him, but on the other hand, you know, I, I learned all the Sifrei Ma'aral, I think almost all of them already. 
I, I don't, it's very scary for me to say such words. Against the not against Hashem, but like that I hope somebody argues with the Maharal. But the Maharal says that if a person has a mitzvah to do and he could have done it right then, and he pushed it off even by a second, he already loses 50% of the schar of the mitzvah. Why? Because Hashem rewards a person based on how important it was to him. And if he delayed it, it wasn't important to him anymore. He ended up doing it because he felt guilty not to do it, or because he promised to do it, or because whatever reason he did it. But it wasn't important to him anymore. Now, I'm not saying sometimes we really can do something right away. That's perfectly fine. People have a life. But just think, is this important enough to me, or, or is it not important enough to me? But now we could piece together the rest of the puzzle and end off with an unbelievable thought. This thought doesn't come from me. Somebody told it to me in the name of Rabbi Zamir Cohen from Idabrut in Israel. But I like the thought, so I want to share it with you. He said, uh, I guess it's a, I don't believe it's a true story, but probably a parable, but it's brilliant anyway, um, that there was a guy who his mother had a birthday. And he wanted to buy his mother a birthday present. And he was a well-off man. And he decided that uh, he's going to ask his mother straight out what to buy her. Which in a way, believe it or not, is a smart thing. Why give somebody gifts that they don't need and don't want? If you're already doing it, give, it, give them what they want. Make them happy. He calls his mother, he says, Mom, don't tell me don't and you don't need to or not. It's going to happen anyway. So once I'm spending money, at least it should be what you want. There is no price cap. You know I have a, I'm well off. Is there anything that I can buy you that you're going to enjoy? And he tells him, yeah, there is something. So he was excited. What? He's going to buy his mother something that's going to make, him happy, make her happy. She said, years ago I had a pearl necklace that I used to like a lot. I lost it. I never said anything because I didn't want people to feel bad and go running to buy me a new one or whatever. But I like it. I like the look of it. This is more or less what it looked like, this color, this this, this that, this size, well, more or less whatever she knew. And if you could get me something similar, it would mean a lot to me. If you're already buying me a gift anyway, you're saying you're spending the money anyway, so I don't feel bad. This is what it is. He says, Mom, I love you. You made my life easy. Otherwise, I have to go be thinking what to get, and he wouldn't be happy anyway. Uh, by today, it's done. Goes racing to the first jewelry store that he thinks has good stuff. Tells the guy all the criteria and whatever. Guy says, listen, exactly that I don't have. He says, make it custom, whatever you got to do. It's for my mom, it's his birthday, this is what she wants. Perfect, flawless. Fine. A couple days later, it's ready, he picks it up, he pays for it. A couple thousand dollars. And brings it to his mother. He brings it to his mother, and the family gets together for like a little birthday party, and they, he presents the mother this gift, and she's so happy, because obviously she had some emotional attachment to this thing previously. Who else is by the birthday? This guy who bought his mother a gift, brought his children. He has a daughter, it's like a five-year-old, who's by the birthday party. And she sees grandma putting on her new pearl necklace. And she goes to her mother and begins a terror campaign. I also want one. She's five years old. I also want one. First, obviously, the mother said, are you crazy? <laughs> it's for somebody much older. You know? Five-year-olds don't wear such things. I want one. Go reason with a five-year-old. I don't know if you ever tried. Good luck. I want one. That's it. I want one. I want, I don't want, back and forth and back and forth. She wants one. Not only that, she wants the pearls to be pink. I don't know anything about pearls. I don't know if that makes it cheaper or more expensive, but that's what she wants. After two days, the mother calls her husband on the phone at work one day and says, listen, my dear husband, I love you to death. I love your mother to death, but soon I'm going to die. This girl is making me nuts. What do we do? We're not buying her a $2,000 thing, the necklace right now, right? We all understand that. But she doesn't stop. What do we do? Husband was a sharp guy. He says, "Hun, he thinks he knows the difference between real, fake, expensive, cheap. What does she know? She knows she wants pink pearls. Go on to the dollar store, 99 cents, pick up pink pearls, give it to her. She'll be the happiest girl in the world. My husband, I knew you were brilliant. Thank you very much. She goes to the dollar store, spends two bucks instead of one, one for the necklace, one for a little box to put it in. Brings it to her daughter, I bought you a present just like grandma. And the daughter, like, the happiest girl in the world. 
What's the problem with the 99 cent pearls? That after a day, they start uh, rubbing out and looking like a uh, tissue buff, like lab-grown diamonds. Doesn't look good. But the daughter doesn't care. Because to her, what does a five-year-old know? She wanted her pink pearl. She has them. But now the mother's embarrassed, because even on the, even on a kid's level, like, it makes them look poor that their daughter's wearing something rubbed out. They're a wealthy family. So now the mother's on a reverse campaign. Give me back that necklace, I'll get you a new one. She figures we'll buy something a little better quality at least. No, this is my necklace, you're not going to take it away from me. Nothing doing. The girl sleeps with it, bathes with it, this with it, lives with it, everything with it. A day or two go by, again she goes to her husband. Honey, I don't know, this, this, this girl, this, it's a lose-lose with her. We got to get that ugly thing off of her. Uh, this can't go on. He tells her, listen, I put her to bed every night. I always tell her bed nights, uh, good night story and whatever, and hug her and kiss her. It's a very special moment between us. And that moment, I'll sneak in the request that she should give me the necklace and I'll get her something else instead, maybe, or whatever. I'll bribe her with candy or God knows what. And hopefully it'll work. He tries and it fails. Daddy, this is mine. That's it. You gave it to me. It's mine. Not coming off. I love it. Okay, he goes to his wife and he says, this should be a big problem with our kid. There's other people are dealing with kids that are sick. Uh, this kid, so she likes it, the necklace looks stupid, who cares? I said, well, you're embarrassed. It's against thine heart, it's fine. <laughs> it's against thine heart, it's fine. And he makes peace with it. And she makes peace with it. A week later, his daughter comes to him, and on her own, takes off the necklace, and hands it to him. Dad, I thought about it for a week, and if you say that it doesn't look nice and I shouldn't wear it, then it's not respectable for me, then who am I that say different? You're older, you're smarter, here's your necklace. And you don't have to get me anything else instead, I'm perfectly happy, I don't need nothing, everything's fine. And the guy tells her one sec. He goes running up to his bedroom, he comes back down one minute later, and he hands her a box. And she opens up the box, and inside the box there was a $2,000 necklace identical to the one he bought his mother. He says, my dear daughter, when I came to you that night and asked you to give me the necklace, I already had this in my pocket. And why am I giving this to you? It's insane. A five-year-old shouldn't be wearing expensive jewelry. It's, it's totally nuts. You know why I'm giving this to you? Because I want you to take away from this story a lesson for life. When you're willing to give your father one, he, gi he gives you back in return 2,000. If we're give, willing to give HaKadosh Baruch Hu one effort of living a life of Zivu Rishon, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu is willing to give us back thousands and thousands times over of Shefa, Lachav, Atzlachav, Amen, Amen, Shabbat Shalom, Baruch.